All right, let's get started. I'll share my screen and pull up um, the PowerPoint. Move this out of the way a little bit. And uh, get my pointer here. You can come over to the. Can you bring it around here? Okay. For a moment. Hmm. Well, darn it, my pointer isn't showing. Well, there. It's hard to see it. Okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll find it later. All right. So, again, welcome this evening, everyone, to our third webinar for the season. And we're going to be looking at grasses today. So, I thought LMS would be a good topic because of the recent nomenclatural changes that have happened. Quite a few of them have um, occurred with the um, publication and, and revision that's happened with Florida North America. So it's time to get updated and up, up to speed on Elemis. So just a little bit of background, of course, on grasses and a little bit of morphology since Elemis, of course, is a grass, as I'm sure you all know, wild rice. Um, what we see up in the upper left is just the, there we go, now I can see it. Uh, it is just to sort of the classification for Alamus. Obviously, they're in the Poaceae, the grass family. They're in the subfamily Poaceae, which uh, includes um, a lot of cool season grasses, a lot of both native and non-native cool season grasses um, named after the blue grasses. The tribe Triticeae uh, is the tribe that they're in. That's sort of, again, a level that's below subfamily and, and above genus. You'll see over here the breakdown of the grass family diversity. And by the way, I, you probably know that grass family is one of the most diverse families. It is the fourth largest plant family with 11,783 species globally. Uh, you see there's 12 subfamilies and almost 790 genera. Of course, these numbers change and fluctuate depending upon the most recent uh, work that's been done and published in terms of um, phylogenetic changes and work that people are doing to revise different groups. So again, the tribe is, is this um, level in between here. There's 25 uh, tribes currently for uh, North America that are present in North America. I broke down the North America numbers here uh, into those that are native to North America in parentheses, and then those that are not native, but naturalized, meaning that they, you know, again, they don't belong here, they're not native, but they reproduce on their own. They are self-sustaining populations. Uh, often, you know, these are the problem species. Uh, that naturalized species are also potentially in, invasive species because they're, they can do so well. And then there's another group for grasses really that aren't really naturalized. They're not native, but they're not really out there able to sustain themselves either. So we can kind of put it in this category of uh, some of these are ornamental grasses. And so they're really just grown in gardens. Some of them are just here because of research and are mainly just found in plots or, or maybe in greenhouses. And wave is a term that's used to describe um, sort of species that are somewhat inventive and they, they look like they begin to naturalize, but then they die out more or less and they don't become fully self-sustaining. You can see that in the grasses, uh, there's a pretty large percentage of them that are not native. Again, these two groups down here add these together here uh, to get the non-native ones. Of course, a lot of that's because a lot of grasses have been introduced for forage and ornamental person, uh, re reasons and turf grass and all those sorts of things. So um, the poesy has a, a large component of non-native. Over here again, um, elemis, and the term elemis comes from Greek, the word elio, E-L-Y-O, which means rolled up. And that seems to refer to the way that the fruits, which we'll talk about in a bit, caryopsis, one of these down here, the fruit of the grass is somewhat rolled up in between the floral bracts, uh, what are called dilemma and palea, and we'll talk about those too. But it's, it's 
basically the fruit is sort of concealed and rolled up between those bracts. That's where the term comes from. So globally, there's about 300 species of LMS, North America, 39. And again, this is the breakdown for native, naturalized, and or ornamental. The Niowa, we have now 12 species total, 11 of them are native and one that's not. And this went up from six total species from Islers and Rusa back in 1994. And again, a lot of that's because of that taxonomic revision that's happened. So the rest of this shows some characteristics, of course, of the poaceae of grasses and then pictures that help describe uh, some of the terminology, uh, what it all means. So grasses uh, mostly have open leaf sheaths. So again, when we think about a leaf sheath, this diagram down here is probably the best. This leaf here, which is composed of the blade and also the sheath, the sheath is this part. The leaf actually attaches right down here at the node. But the first part of the leaf, and some, some say that that's a modified petiole, um, who knows for sure probably, but the first part of this leaf is the sheath. So it's a part of the leaf, but it wraps around the stem. And then when it reaches a certain height, then the leaf blade um, becomes apparent. The leaf blade is, a top, is attached to the top of the sheath. And of course, this is the photosynthetic part. The sheath, you might say, is just sort of a, you know, it's certainly some support structure. The more sheath there is, the more support there is for that leaf in terms of binding it to the, the shoot. Um, there might be some other um, reasons, of course, for the, the sheath as well. So what we say when we say it's an open sheath, that's what we see up here. The sheath on this um, picture here of uh, silky wild rye is open. And most grass sheaths are open, as it says here, which means that the sheath uh, is that, you know, again, it forms this tube, if you will, of sort that wraps around the stem and around the node, or excuse me, around the internode, the part of the stem between two nodes. But it, the, um, the sheath isn't a continuous piece of tissue. It's not a complete tube, if you will. It's, it's, there, there's a split in it, if you will, and you see the split right here. These, this is one margin of the sheath, and this is the other margin here, and they're not fused together. So again, that means that the sheath is open. You could pull on this, you could pull on this leaf blade here and force the sheath to come away from the stem. And if the sheath is open, it'll do that easily because there's nothing really to prevent the sheath from you know, opening up and, and coming away from the stem. Now, if it's a closed sheath, and one thing that separates a lot of the sedges, of course, from the grasses is the sedges have closed sheaths, then this is a single piece of tissue that completely surrounds the stem. Uh, that would not have these margins here. In a sense, these margins would be fused to each other so that we, again, we have just a continuous tissue forming this tube. And then when that happens, pulling on the leaf, uh, it's not so easy to pull the sheath away from the stem, of course, because of solid tissue that it surrounds it. You can, of course, it, but the sheath will tear. The other important aspect of, or another important aspect of the leaves are two rank, which means that they occur on opposite sides of the stem, but not, they're not opposite per se. Opposite means that there's two of them at a node. Um, that doesn't happen in grass. So in grasses, leaves are alternate. There's only one leaf attached to a node. But if you went up to the next node, the leaf that's attached here would be on the other side of the stem. So if you were looking at the plant from the top down, uh, the, the leaves would be lined up basically is what that means. Ligules are almost always present. As it says here, here's a good example of a very conspicuous uh, membranous ligule. Looks like it could be reed canary grass, but I don't have the name of that, that grass there. But, um, and membranes are one form of a ligule, but ligules can also be like this fringe of hair as we see right here on this uh, panic grass. I believe this is a species of um, Scribner's panic grass. And sometimes, uh, the ligule can be, it can be a membrane in the lower half, and then it can have some hairs or essentially a fringe of hairs or a row of hairs that come off the top. 
So it can be a combination of both hair of both hairs and a mem membrane. They're almost always present. They're not always as conspicuous as this, though. Many of the legals in the wild rice certainly are pretty easily found and visible, um, but they're not this this large. The florets or the flowers, and we call them florets because they're very, very, very tiny, small flowers. So the term floret just simply means a very small flower. The, the primary inflorescence is the way that the flowers are arranged. And inflorescence is a way of describing how flowers are arranged and how they're presented. When we talk about the primary inflorescence, then we are absolutely talking about the flowers themselves and, and where those flowers are arranged and how they are arranged. And in grasses, they're all arranged in these spikelets. Here's a real sort of generic picture of a spikelet. Um, a spikelet many times has two bracts or scales that subtend the spikelet. Here it says spikelets with two scales of bracts. Those are called glooms. So there's a lower gloom and an upper gloom. Um, the lower one right here, the upper one right here, or sometimes it's um, the, the smaller and larger gloom, but most of the time, um, lower and upper are the terms used. And they, again, they sit at the bottom of the spikelet. And then up above the spikelet are all the flowers. These are, it says they're florets, but we're, what we're actually seeing here, we don't see much of the flower itself. What we're seeing are the backs of the lemmas because each floret is surrounded by two scales or bracts, one called the lemma and one called the palea. The lemma is the larger one and it's more on the outside. It's the one that we can see. It's the one that's sort of facing us or, or again is, is um, seen when looking at the spikelet. This diagram over here shows again another spikelet here and I've color coded this to help you see both uh, this view, which is similar to this view, of course, looking at the entire spikelet, and then looking at sort of a long section through it. And you can see here, this, this helps, see, helps you see again, uh, kind of how these, this, well, first of all, here, here are the glooms down here in red, two of them again. But then uh, up above that, we got four florets. And again, the blue are the lemmas. They are, they are sort of the lower and the more outside uh, scale or bract that's associated with the flowers. Then the palea uh, here is in orange, and as you can see, the paleas are on the inside. So again, when we're looking at a spikelet, uh, we really can't see the paleas very well unless you pull things apart. This picture here has a little bitty part of a palea uh, visible right here, <laughs> just a tiny little bit sliver of orange right there. And you can see again, what happens is the lemon palea together, they enclose the flower. So these, these are the flowers inside here. And this one you can see pretty well. Uh, grass flowers are really reduced. They have just three stamens. They have a pistil, compound pistil, that's usually formed from three carpels or two carpels. Uh, the ovary is this little circle right down here. And then there's a style with a couple of style branches coming off of it. There are no petals, there are no sepals. It's just reduced to as I said, a single compound pistil and three stamens. And those are all very, very small, of course. And they're usually not very visible because, again, they're enclosed by the lemma and pa palea. The ovary, of course, right down here, again, becomes the fruit when everything goes right and fertilization happens and a seed begins to form, a baby plant. The seeds uh, are forming down inside the ovary, of course, where an ovule was. That's where the egg was that got fertilized, and that's what's becoming the new baby plant. The ovary entirely becomes the fruit, and in grasses, the fruit is called a caryopsis. A caryopsis is sort of a specialized kind of a keen, and if you remember what a keen is, it's the keen is a general term for a, a dry meaning that there's no fleshiness to it like a cherry or a peach or a plum. Um, it's also indehiscent, which means that it doesn't split open on its own in any way, shape or form. The only way it, the, the um, seed comes out of the fruit basically is if the fruit wall deteriorates enough and just kind of degrades and, and falls apart. So it's indehiscent, it doesn't split on, 
on its own accord. Uh, it's one seeded. So there's just one seed inside each fruit. So that's what an akeen is. Now, a caryopsis is sort of a specialized kind of akeen in which the seed coat is fused to the pericarp, which is the fruit wall. The, what was the wall of the ovary uh, becomes the pericarp or the fruit wall. And the fruit wall and the, is on the outside of the fruit, of course. And then the seed is inside the fruit and it has a seed coat, which is protective or covering for the seed itself and the embryo that it contains. What I'm saying then is that seed coat and that fruit wall fuse together. They fuse together into sort of just a solid piece of tissue, which means again, you really can't separate the seed from the fruit very well. And the dispersal unit then really is the fruit itself, the caryopsis. And that's, that's a picture of one right here. A, a kernel of corn is, is a great example, of course. All right, so that's some general stuff on grass morphology and uh, terminology. A few of the characteristics for the Tritisii, the tribe that Elmus is in. Um, these are just some of the, the main, main, you know, sort of characteristics. So spikelets always are perfect, meaning that they have both sexes. Um, there's usually one or more of the of the florets, you know, in a spikelet. So, but that that describes most grasses. Um, most of these have, I mean, all of them have C C three photosynthesis, which is the sort of the cool season, you know, photosynthesis. Secondary inflorescences. This is probably the most important part. So, a secondary inflorescence is the way that the primary inflorescences. Are, and again, remember, primary inflorescence is called a spikelet. They're always called spikelets. And the reason they're called a spikelet, let me just go back to this, is because you see here, here are the, the places where the flowers are again. They're hidden by the lemmas. But when you have flowers that are attached to a central axis by their base and really don't have a flower stem or what's called a pedicel, uh, that is something that's called a spike. When flowers are attached to the central axis without the presence of a pedicel or a stem, that's called a spike. So that's, that's what these are. These are spikes because these flowers don't have a pedicel. They're attached right to the stem at their base, but it's a really, really tiny spike. And so the term spikelet is used for that reason. So what we're saying here is those spikelets are also arranged in a, either a spike or a seam. And that's best to see here with quackgrass, Elemis repens. These are the spikelets, these green things here, and they are attached themselves with a peduncle. And uh, that's the term that you see right here. Peduncle is the, is the, stem of an inflorescence. So they are attached um, by really not much of a peduncle. Again, there are, if the peduncle is there, then it's a racine because there is a little bit of a stem there. But if there isn't really any peduncle, then it's a spike. And, you know, in a lot of cases, it, you know, it's a, it's a subjective call whether there's a, a, enough peduncle there to call it a racine or not. So it's, it's, they're either a spike or a seam, but again, they're terminal, which means they uh, are at the top of the shoot system. And there's just one of them per, per shoot system, of course, one of them per, per stem. So that's what that means. There's one to five spikelets at each node of this axis here that runs through the secondary inflorescence. Now in Elemis repens, there's just one spikelet per node, but many of the other Elemis have two to five. Now it says here, at least one of those is sessile, um, meaning that again, the spikelet really functions as, again, as a, as a I mean, it, it is a spike because there isn't any stem there. Uh, some of the spikelets can have a little bitty tiny peduncle. So again, it's sort of a combination then of a spike and a racine. That's where we use both of those terms. In many species, the spikelets are laterally compressed, which means they're 
kind of compressed from the sides, which what, what way we would recognize that is come back to this picture of a spike. Um, if the if you sort of compress this from the side, what happens is these glooms uh, and even the lemmas to some extent sort of get folded over and they have a very strong keel then down their back because they are, are sort of folded in half along the center line of that gloom along the center line of that lemma. Uh, if they were uh, folded from the sort of the top down, then um, they would be more totally flat. So that's, again, if there is any kind of compression happening, at least uh, it's laterally, uh, there's usually then often a, a flat side that's up against the axis of the inflorescence. Um, glooms too, as, as normal, often though these glooms are not very, you know, sort of herbaceous or scale-like or leaf-like. They have this more of a leathery texture, a tough sort of texture to them. And we can see um, here's some glooms right here on this uh, silky wild rye. So here's two spikelets right here attached at the same node. This is a spikelet with two glooms. This is a floret right here. Here's another spikelet right here with one gloom here and one gloom here. Um, these And the other thing about elemas and often uh, triticii uh, is that going back to, again, this generalized picture of a Spike that these glooms sort of, you know, kind of uh, encompass and, and overlap with the bottoms of these florets, the bottoms of these lemmas. So there's a lemma here. This this uh, lower gloom is overlapping with this lemma. This upper gloom is overlapping with this lemma. And, you know, they are basically uh, side by side in a sense. You can kind of see that here, too. A lot, of, a lot of cases in the triticii, uh, the glooms are not doing that at all. The glooms are like divergent, uh, branching somewhat and angled somewhat away from the lemma that we see right here that, again, is part of that floret. Ligules usually always membranous. We don't see fringe of hairs like in the panic grass picture back there. Now, sometimes there can be uh, what's called a ciliolate, which means very, very tiny, small, fine hairs that are present uh, on the uh, margin or the top of that. But that's pretty unusual. Oracles are usually always present. No, not always, but usually. And here's a great picture. Here's a couple of pictures of oracles. This might be the best right here. Uh, these oracles right here are these appendages. There are always two of them. They're paired. They're um, sort of extensions of tissue extensions. Uh, oracle means sort of an ear-like lobe. Here you can see an uh, actual picture of them right here. Uh, they're identified right here as well, an oracle. So they're like the little flaps of tissue, essentially, that come off the base of the leaf or the top of the sheath, again, we're talking about the point right where the, the base of the leaf blade, that's what this means, uh, and the top of the sheath meet, that's where the ligules are right here. And so if this was to have an oracle, it doesn't, it's going to come off right here. And that oracle kind of wraps around to the front side or to the other side of, of the stem somewhat. Uh, oracles are really obvious and pretty easy to see. And so again, they are somewhat useful. So as pointed out again, in Triticii, they're usually always present. And the sheaths are always open. Now when we look at Elemus, now we're pointing in, you know, on a subset of the Triticii. This was the tribe. And there's probably, oh, there's probably at least a dozen different genera in the Triticii. So now this is all stuff that pertains to elements itself. So the spikelets in groups of two to four at each node, um, that's the most common situation. All of those spikelets are, are, um, have fertile flowers. Now they may not be all, not all two to seven of these flowers may be fertile, but all of the spikelets have at least some fertile flowers. And that's what that means. 
quite often when there's, you know, two, three, four, five, six, uh, or whatever number of florets inside a single spikelet, it might be uh, a couple of those are not fertile, at least the, the ones that are at the very top. Now, some of the LMS have only one spikelet. And I mentioned that with crack grass. So what this means is, okay, so it's not uniformly two to four. If only one spikelet per, per node, then these plants are perennial. Um, that takes out some of the um, wheat um, species. And the spikelets are erect to strongly ascending. So, so this goes back to the fact that in the old system in, in Islas and Rosa, before Ford North America came out, a lot of these three species right here were all agropyrons. And we can see now um, they're not. Uh, in fact, there's only two agropyrons now with the new floor of North America uh, taxonomy. There's only two agropyrons, and both of them were non-native. This is crested wheatgrass. It's a non-native species. And then there's a, another one. And then this is... This used to be an agropyron too, but now it's not. It's Pascal pyrum. This is Western wheatgrass, Pascal pyrum smithii. And again, so what, what sort of happened uh, in all of that shuffling around is all the agropyrons got kind of broken up. Uh, some of them became elements like quack grass and slender wheatgrass. So the point here is that it can be difficult to some extent separating elements from these other what used to be agropyrons and this one still is and so that's what this is kind of focusing on here and i'll give you some help with with um, separating elements from these sort of lookalikes well um again if you have only one spike that's what elements uh, reference has here one spike per node the spikeless erect is strongly ascending um these are certainly strongly ascending uh, they're pointed mostly up uh, loosely spaced along the axis with internodes three to nine millimeters near the metal. So the internodes are this, again, the spaces between where the spikelets are attached. Spikelets are attached at the nodes. And so the internodes is the distance along this axis between the nodes. And so we can easily see it. It's this yellow arrow right here. And that's about right in the middle of the um, secondary inflorescence, this, this spike. And what we're saying then is that yellow arrow is, is at least three to nine millimeters in length or so. That's going to help separate it from um, this agropyron over here now, because um, those internode distances are much less over here. Uh, I have... Um, over on my other computer, and I've got the the link there. It's um, breakage center nodes are less than certainly less than um, five millimeters, so they overlap just a little bit. This is three to nine. Uh, this one here is is more in the in the range of like point two to maybe three or so. And you can see really easily that these spikelets are much more compressed together. They're a lot closer together along the axis here than what these are. Now, the way to separate elements from Pascal pyrum mainly is because Pascal pyrum looks more like this. The internodes are, are greater than what they are in agropyron. But the way to separate this one out, and, and there's only one species of Pascal pyrum in North America, Western wheatgrass is basically these, these leaf blades. Um, leaf blades not deeply grooved on the above surface, the top surface, like they are here in Pascal Pyrum. See how deeply the, this leaf surface is grooved? These locations where the veins are here between each of them, there's a there's deep groove, very conspicuous in that regard. And this, and this is again the top of the leaf. For quack grass, that's not the case. Um, you can see veins, but they're not nearly this conspicuous. Also, the glooms um, lack cilia towards their base. If you are looking at the florets again, the glooms on uh, Pascal pyrum, there are some little cilia, again, short little hairs towards the uh, bottom of the glooms. 
And again, in LMS, those are not going to be there. Glooms are lacking those. So that's how LMS would be sort of separated from these two look-alike and previous plants that were all classified together in the same genus. All right, so that is an overview of kind of the, what makes LMS an LMS. I think now might be a good time to look at the table. So I'll pull that up quick here. So again, this is a table that shows the LMS that are in Iowa. And again, um, if you've seen these before, you kind of know how this works, I guess, but five different columns here. Uh, the ex explanation is back here at the very end, the fields in table one here, what each of those columns is, is showing you basically. And, and since I'm here, I'll also point out that uh, I have also have listed some of the probable Iowa hybrids. So LMS is a, it's not a real hard genus to recognize, uh, so to speak, because of the uniqueness of those secondary inflorescences. Uh, you again have to separate it from agropyron and pascopyron, but um, it's pretty distinct from lots of other grasses. But because of hybridization, again, which is something that mixes the features of two species together into an individual that's a little bit of both, of course, that's what we mean by a hybrid. Um, they can be difficult. It can be a little bit challenging. So these are, uh, these are named hybrids right here between the parent species. And again, all of these are species we have in Iowa here. And I know there's also potential hybrids between these species here, but I couldn't find any uh, name that's been assigned to those yet. And it's important for that, L, um, LMS can also hybridize with Horium, which is a different genus in the, uh, in the Tritistii. Um, uh, barley grass, if you know what that looks like, squirrel tail barley grass, Horium ju jubatum is the one that uh, seems to, again, be the target here with uh, these three species. And so we get a hybrid between two genera, uh, an intergeneric hybrid. And those have this name, Eliohordium, and then a, a particular uh, epithet there for which one of the parents are involved. And I also point out here that um, there are some elements and species, uh, excuse me, there's some element species in states that are surrounding us uh, and almost completely surrounding us. These are the ones in which there's elements, these three, these three species occur in these states. And, you know, in, in some cases, I mean, they're on both on east and west sides of us. So it wouldn't be surprising, perhaps, if, if these species were to be found in the state at some point. It's kind of a kind of word that we haven't seen them yet uh, in some ways. But again, going up here, it shows the 12 species here, um, the Florida North America name, the Islers and Rosa name, common names. I've also described what the, uh, the grass growth form here, and basically we're talking about just cespitos which means that the, there really aren't any rhizomes of any substantial nature. Uh, all of the shoots that come up or all of the tillers that come up from uh, the perennial and perinating uh, tissue below ground come up in a cluster, in a, in a clump. Uh, and that's what cespitos means, tightly clumped. Now, there are a couple of these um, that are somewhat loosely cespitos, so can of wild rye, and that means because there are some rhizomes, but their rhizomes are very short. So the rhizomes can uh, provide a little bit of horizontal growth away from the perinating tissue. And those, of course, those can produce above ground tillers and above ground shoots. So the, the cluster might not be quite so dense and that's what loosely cespitos means. Um, the only other one that's really rhizomatous is quack grass. Good information here on habitat, uh, a map showing where they are found in Iowa. Uh, these maps right here come from the Grasses of Iowa website, which is probably the best information as far as the um, biogeography in Iowa goes. And then a bone app map showing the biogeography for the United States. So again, that's what we see here. The, um, 
status is whether it's native or not native, the Iowa coefficient of conservatism. Um, so here's a good point, place to point out kind of what happened um, with the additional six species that we now have uh, of Alamos. Um, four of them actually came from, from within Alamos. So this one here, Alamos curvatus, well, that's basically taking Virginicus and splitting off a variety that had been recognized, variety submuticus. Um, some had already separated it off as this species, but um, for some reason that's not the correct name. So Alamos curvatus is now the correct name here. But guess what this simply means? Well, this this probably was formerly in either Zenrosis terminology. This was just recognized as Virginia wild rye, but now it is split off. Um, another one came from um, this one right here, which was just basically a taxonomic change. So um, you can see that this was a, a synonym for it, for Elemis interruptus, which also was a variety of canadensis in some people's eyes. And so now it's just officially making it, uh, making it official now with Florida North America that it's, it is a separate species. It's not the same. Uh, uh, this species still exists, uh, but it grows down here along the um, southern border from Texas over to California. So Interruptus still is, an, still is a species, but it does not occur in Iowa. And this one, by the way, is, is also one that is a uh, special concern. And as you can see, only two counties are known for it. And we don't even know for sure if it's even in Iowa anymore, because the last observation was in 1953. So that's a long time ago, obviously. And um, the, the two populations that were observed up here in these counties, um, who knows if they're still, if they're still there, uh, most likely not. This is another one that split off from Virginia wild rye, as you can see, it wasn't included in Islands and Rosa, uh, like Curvatus here, and it, because again, it was a, a variety that split off. That's another uh, new species. Here's another one. Now, Matt Gregor, I, I don't know for sure why that's not a taxonomic thing. Uh, Islers and Rosa just missed it apparently. Uh, apparently there weren't any vouchers for it until after Islers and Rosa was published or something. I have seen this species uh, in Story County. Uh, it grows in, in flood plains. Um, so I you know it's a good species in Iowa. Here's one of the new LMS and it gets just a conversion of agropyron. Uh, again, and that happened for a couple of, of species for Agropyron and also for uh, Hystrix Petula right here again, which was renamed and, and moved over to Elemis. So a couple of the new species come from just that reassignment. Um, and then um, this is also a reassignment, of course, from Agropyron, tricky column to Elemis for slender wheatgrass. Uh, so there's three of them like that, I guess, and there's also three of them that are um, new species, partly from taxonomic work. All right, so there you go. That's a quick look at that table, which I hope is useful to you in terms of, again, understanding some of the ecology uh, in this group. So <clears throat> you can go back. Okay. Okay, I'll just do it this way. There we go. All right, now we're ready to start uh, looking at identification of those 12 species. Uh, 12 isn't too bad, so we shouldn't have too much problem getting through these. Here on this slide here, we've got all of them here, all 12 species starting at the top. And we're going to split them. This is an actual key that I've written um, for, the, for my uh, grass workshops. I have written a key for a new key, a revised key. Um, there was a key out there that Dr. Paul, a famous uh, agristologist at Iowa State, had written many, many years ago, but badly out of date because of all the taxon uh, taxonomy changes and so forth and new species. So um, I've written a new key for all of the grasses in Iowa. And so this is just that section of the key for the genus Elemis. So there's a lot of Unfortunately, there's a lot of botanical 
uh, terminology in here uh, because it is written, you know, from a, a mechanical key sort of way. Uh, try to um, interpret what those terms mean as, as we go. If you have any questions, of course, you know them in the chat or whatever. But the, the first split, the key, of course, is always of just taking this, the species and splitting them into smaller and smaller groups based upon some characteristics that you can see, hopefully pretty easily, and are as diagnostic. Diagnostic means being able to diagnose you know, what the species is. We want very diagnostic features. We may be able to tell two species are different species because they may have different numbers of chromosomes. But that doesn't help us when we're trying to identify them. So we always have to have you know, morphological, uh, observable diagnostic features that we can use to uh, determine which species we have. And this first uh, couple, if you will, 1A and 1B is, is real simple. It's one that's going to separate out those uh, LMS, and there's just two of them, that have just a single spike. Uh, at the nodes, uh, most almost all the time, you know, it says one at all or most nodes. So universally, you know, maybe there might be one in there that's got two, but um, the majority of those nodes has just a single uh, spikelet versus uh, spikelets two to three can be as much as five is what that uh, parenthesis dash five means. Uh, multiple spikelets at the nodes. And that's going to be this other group, then group B, that's got 10 species in it. Now, I've, I've tried to help you a little bit by putting some of the um, features in blue font that you know, might be more helpful in terms of uh, what you should be looking for when you use this key, because there is a lot of overlap in these keys, uh, and it was just not it couldn't be avoided. Uh, lots, lots of these things do overlap. That's why LMS are not easy to key out. But I've tried to point out some of the, the more diagnostic features uh, that might be more helpful by putting them into blue font. So that, this one is, is splitting off two species then. Uh, we can see them right here. Group A species are these two right here, then quack grass and slender wheatgrass. Again, both of these used to be in Agropyron, uh, so not unusual that they would both split out together here then at this point. So the 2A and 2B is separating uh, these two species then. And again, it's mostly on the basis of the shape of the spikelets. We can see here ovate means egg-shaped, so somewhat broader towards the base and, 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 and tapering towards the top mostly wider than the rachis. Again, the rachis is the axis, that central axis that the spikelets are attached to, versus here, the spikelet slender, scarcely wider than the rachis, except in on forms. So you see there's always a problem. <clears throat> there's always variation. I have two inflorescences here. Uh, this one has has ons uh, in the um, spike. They, they could be on the they could be on the glooms. They could be on the lemmas. Uh, ons are usually on either one of those two uh, parts of the spikelet. And you can see that this one is somewhat. Uh, they, the spikelets look a little bit wider here. But look at this one right here. This one is an unawned one. Here we can see the spikelets are barely as wide, or just maybe just slightly wider than that axis that they're attached to. Um, that's what we're talking about with, with this part of the key here. Now, there's some other things in here about um, quack grass is usually strongly rhizomatous, which of course means you see a lot of, of um, shoots, lots of tillers coming up. It, it comes up in a patch, if you will. Uh, and slender weed grass is not so much that way. Um, not or weakly rhizomatous, but sometimes strongly rhizomatous. So again, there, there's, we're looking at sort of again what some of these features are good um, because they will point you one way or the other, but you have to be aware that there can be overlap. So you have to often use multiple things here. The last thing is mentioned here is whether or not the, um, how the 
spikelets break apart when the seed or the fruit is really to be dispersed. Really, again, it's the fruit that's being dispersed, not the seed itself, because the seed's inside the fruit. So what happens in, in uh, quack grass is this whole thing, the whole secondary inflorescence just kind of breaks apart. So it says tending to disarticulate or come apart entirely from that axis. And you essentially have a naked axis here at some point. Uh, at least parts of it, as everything just breaks apart. Over here, that doesn't happen quite that way. Um, what happens over here is the florets drop from those glooms. The glooms stay on the axis. They persist. And it's just the, the floret, which now, at, at, at this point, is just going to be the caryopsis. You know, it's just going to be the ovary that's, that's become the fruit. And so that, that could be helpful if, if you're at the point where uh, dispersal of fruits has started to occur. The other thing that's, that I'll point out here, because it's in this picture, and this, this picture shows both of them together here, uh, repens again here and here. And what we're looking at is you know, one side and then flipped over to the other side for quack grass. And then slender wheatgrass in the middle here, the same thing. And what we're looking at here is a part of the rachis. That's what this little part right here, uh, that rachis again, that the spikelets are attached to. Uh, quite often in slender wheatgrass, this rachis, if you can dig down in there and find it, you can see it's got hairs on it. Uh, these hairs are, are not always present, but they're usually there. The rucilla as a it says here in, in a note that I made, the rubiculars are um, mostly hairy. Those hairs are uh, about 0.3 millimeter long, so they're not very big, but um, enough hairs are certainly to tell that there's some pubescence here and there's not any pubescence over here. That could be a helpful hint. There's pictures here that show, you know, show the oracles, it shows the uh, ligules, Here's a ligule down here. Uh, here's a ligule right here. Most of, most of these ligules are short little membranes, probably about 0.5 to one millimeter or so. And in general, there's just not a lot of very good diagnostic features associated with the ligules or the oracles or the she's to use to separate these species, unfortunately. Um, too much, over, too much overlap there. All right, now we're going to go to group B. And again, remember that group B has got 10 species in it. So the next slide shows group B with 10 species. And we're going to make another split. And again, as it turns out, this is how this whole key works. Every time we make a split, we split out two species. We're going to split out two species here into group C. And then the other group, uh, D, has got eight species. And this one is based on another fairly easy characteristic to, to see, as, as you can see there, if you're reading the key, uh, looking at the glooms and the, the, you know, the, the body of the gloom, which is most of the gloom tissue, and looking at um, the number of veins that are present. So the 1A is saying gloom bodies with zero or no veins or maybe one vein. That's the usual situation. Um, up to two might be possible. That's sort of the high end possibility, but the typical situation is zero or one. Versus in 3B, gloom bodies with two to five, uh, upwards of eight veins. So just a lot more veins uh, present there. I also have a, in blue, uh, looking at the difference in the gloom's uh, length. So this first part of one, or 3A, excuse me, is, is talking about the glooms, gloom bodies with this number of veins, and it describes the shape of the veins, linear, or excuse me, the shape of the glooms. The glooms are linear or tapering from the base. Uh, how wide are those glooms? 0.1 to 0.6 millimeter, millimeters wide. How long are those glooms, including the on? And then do the glooms differ in any, there's two glooms, remember, and are they differing? Um, for 3A, it says differing in length by more than five millimeters. So usually the two glooms are very different in terms of their length, uh, versus not, in the, not true over here for 3B, the glooms are equal or sub-equal, which means almost equal. 
anytime the prefix sub is used, that means almost. And so again, that, that's another pretty good diagnostic feature. There's some other things in here, of course, again, but that's a pretty good one to, again, say that you're in group C, the differing length of those glooms. Again, remember, you're also looking at the number of veins that are on those glooms. So we get to group C then, and now we're going to split out the two species that are in group C. And um, one of them is very easy to recognize, uh, bottle brush grass. It's a species you probably recognize. If you see it in this situation right here, when we can see the secondary inflorescence, because it has that characteristic bottle brush look to it. Here's a, a close up of one of the spikelets. Here's a gloom right here. And we don't see any other gloom. Maybe there's a tiny little one down here. If there is, then there is a big difference in the length of those glooms. Um, so we're at group C and now how are we gonna separate these two species? Well, again, as I said, bottle brush is pretty easy to separate this gestalt by the inflorescence. Here's the inflorescence of the other one, uh, diversa gloomus, which uh, the common name for that is uh, unequal glooms or diverse gloom wild rye. The, remember the common names are on that, are in table one. I, I didn't have quite enough room to put the common name here. The other thing about diverse gloomus, again, remember that's, that's the one, if you remember that is um, pretty unusual and special concern. And in fact, it could be extirpated. So there's not many pictures of it. I could only find two pictures anywhere and just of the in, inflorescences here. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think this is, this is likely not to be a wild rye you're going to encounter clearly, but the point is to know if you do see something that could be, it would be very, very important, of course, to know because we don't know much about the species in Iowa. If you go back again, look at that table, which um, you, you can look at if you have a handout, uh, diverse gloomus is a northern clearly a northern Midwestern species. Uh, looking at the USA map, it, it does uh, seem to be pretty common up in Minnesota, parts of Northwestern Wisconsin, uh, parts of North Dakota. I saw some vouchers uh, on the sign out website from Wyoming and there's, there's an indication that it's out in Northeastern Wyoming. But in Iowa again, um, just those two counties and, and not since 1953. So you probably don't have to worry about this species, of course. But if you were trying to separate them, here's how you would best separate them in blue here. In bottle brush grass, the glooms are vestigial, which means they're barely even present or maybe one to three millimeters long. Rarely some unequal glooms up to 10, mil 10 millimeters long. That looks like what we might see here when it's a little bit longer, but again, unequal with only one of them that long. Um, very, very narrow. I mean, this is, but this is basically a bristle. Uh, it's, it's so narrow. Versus over here, uh, again, the gloom sometimes vestigial, obsolete, but usually not. Usually there's, they're there and they're two to 15 uh, millimeters long. And again, differing in length by at least four millimeters or so. So that's why it's called diverse gloomus because two glooms that are very diverse in terms of the length of those glooms. All right, um, next group. Well, uh, the next slide is just pictures of some vouchers from um, <clears throat> Cyanet, uh, which again, because again, there's just not many pictures. So here's a couple of vouchers that I found, pictures of vouchers from, these are both from Minnesota, I believe. You could probably zoom in on the label here and see for sure. But just to give you a, a, a whole gestalt picture of what um, the Versaglumus looks like. Unequal gloom wild rye. Now on to group D, which has eight species. And again, we're gonna split two species off. Um, convenient how it works that way. Uh, this is a very important uh, characteristic here. Uh, it splits off two species. Now we'll have uh, in group E and then group F is gonna have the other six species. And um, this one is looking at the gloom bases. This is a very uh, important characteristic to 
be, become familiar with because it's one you use a lot because you're going to be dealing with these eight species by looking at that. And you can see in, in 5A, it says gloom bases are flat and veined. So looking at the base of the glooms and the, the base is fairly flat looking and there's, there's some veins there. But then it says, or if subterrete, which means almost round or actually round to read and indurate means hard, very hard textured, um, then they're going to be hard textured and without veins for less than one millimeter. So this is one of those complicated diagnostic features here. We contrast that with 5B, gloom bases more or less always roundish to read and hard and indurate and without veins for 0.5 to four millimeters. So that's the big difference then over here. In most cases, the gloom bases are not going to be round. They're going to be flat and have veins. But there's enough variation that if they are somewhat round, which is going to make them look like 5B, but if they are somewhat round and hard, then they're without veins for less than one millimeter. Uh, whereas over here, it's a greater distance, up to four millimeters. So there's a, there's a, a greater portion of that lower part of the gloom is unveined. Uh, another one I have uh, marked here in blue is the lemma ons, usually flexus to curving for uh, 5A versus straight over here. Again, there's other stuff in here uh, that you can use, but as, as I said, a lot of times, so those things overlap somewhat, so uh, they're less useful. So what this does is what we are doing here with the lower portions of those glooms is we're splitting off two species, wild candor rye and northern uh, wild rye, Wigandii, which is a species that looks a lot like candor wild rye. And we'll, we'll talk next on how to, how to split those out. But basically, both of these, again, um, in fact, if you, again, look at the table, I believe, I'm, I'm checking here to be sure. Yeah, so in the table, it shows that um, at one time, they were both combined, at least, because there's a synonym for Wigandii, that's Elemis canadensis variety Wigandii. So they at one time they were all combined, um, but that was split out and I just most to recognize that because they do recognize Wigandii as a separate species, but they point out again, a synonym um, takes us back and sees that, that there is this connection between them. So not surprising, they look alike. Uh, they come out here together because they look alike. And um, again, both have that feature of the glooms that I just, just described. So how do you separate canadensis from um, Brigandii? And again, the common name for that is Northern, oh, it's Northern Riverbank Wild Rye or Wiegand's Wild Rye. Um, that's what we see in 6A and, and 6B here. And this is not an easy one. Um, there are some other things I don't have written into the key here that I found. Uh, the Rakus inner nodes, supposedly would be pretty good because they do not overlap really here at all. We can see again the rachis internodes three to five, generally speaking, at the least two, at the most seven millimeters long. Again, remember we're looking at the distance between the places where the spikelets are attached to the rachis. That's, that's an easy thing to find. It's an easy thing to see. It's an easy thing to get a caliper down and measure what those Rekas internodes are. This is much less than the 5 to 12 distance that we see over here for Rigandii. Um, there's, there's overlap in the number of spikelets per node. Uh, the paleas are somewhat different, but they're kind of hard to find and see. Uh, the leaf blades can be somewhat useful, although there's some overlap. What this shows here is that the blades are not quite as wide in canadensis. They're four to 15 millimeters wide generally. That's the main range 
again, the extremes are in parentheses here, um, versus uh, 10 to 20 over here. So obviously there is overlap again, uh, but if you were to find blades that were certainly, you know, 15 to 20, and they, they could be up to 24 over here, um, that's going to point more towards this. Uh, but there are some other things. And so Brigandii in general uh, is a taller species than Canadensis um, with an inflorescence that is much more drooping rather than just arching. Here's an inflorescence that's arching in Canadensis. Now this one is starting to droop a little bit more, but I saw some pictures of um, a clump of uh, Northern Riverbank Wild Rye, and all of the inflorescence look more like this, which is very strongly drooping. And it, maybe it's because it's a little bit longer uh, to some extent, and that makes it more easy to, to droop then. So that's a, a, another aspect. Um, also the glooms. The Regandii glooms are about 0.4 to 0.5 seven millimeters wide at their broadest, the largest glooms. You want to look for the largest ones and see what the maximum size is on these glooms. That's always, that was always, always, always a good idea to try and when you're measuring something is to look for the largest version of that because that shows what the maximum size is as it grows. So again, 0.4 to 0.7 millimeters wide for Regandii and the glooms in Canadensis are 0.7 to 1.6. So they don't overlap much there. If you measured 0.7, then you would be right in the middle, but um, it's a good chance you could measure the, the glooms, the width of the, of the largest glooms and have a, have a clear decision. Okay. Um, going now on now to group F, uh, six species there. So these last uh, six species, it gets a little tougher now with the um, um, separation. Um, the six species that are present here are some of the more common ones like uh, Silky Wild Rye and Virginia Wild Rye. Um, also uh, Riverbank Wild Rye. So what we see in seven, A and seven B is again, splitting off two species from those six. We're gonna split off two species into group G and I'll leave four species in group H there, as you can see. And now lots of, lots of these, lots of this key is always looking at the glooms. Uh, you can see how important the glooms are. So you're gonna have to really, again, get familiar with looking at the spikelets and, and and tearing apart the spike at somewhat and, and measuring things on these glooms. All right, so in 7a, it says the glooms are persistent. The gloom bodies uh, gives you some uh, measurements there for the width uh, with two to four veins. The basal, this is, and that's the blue part. The basal part of the glooms, again, straight or slightly curving versus in the other, Group, the four species over here in group H, the basal one to four clearly bowed out. Now I'll show you a picture of that later when we look at um, the glooms of wild uh, Virginia wild rye, because they are a very good example of what we mean by that. Some of the other species, the other three species aren't quite as strongly, uh, don't quite show that characteristic quite as strongly, but Virginia wild rye does very well. So we're talking about the really just about the base of the glooms here, the base of the glooms, whether they're more or less straight or just maybe this might just be a slight curve in them. Now remember, um, we got to this group here to group six by uh, the, the couplet before saying that the bases of those glooms are mostly round. Uh, they're mostly terete or round and they're hard. Uh, endure it, which again, what that means. Um, and they usually have a space there, uh, a pretty recognizable space where there aren't any veins at the lower part. That's all stuff that, that took us to um, group F. But now we're looking at the base 
of those blooms and, and talking about whether the base is curved out, bowed out, or it's not. So the, the two species that come out here that um, are just maybe slightly curved or straight, uh, the two species in group G, they're gonna key out now here uh, in group G with 8A and 8B. Um, these are two pretty, well, silky wild rye is real common. Uh, Riverbank wild rye uh, is kind of found just more in the, the eastern part of Iowa. But so they, they are both examples of that in which the lower portion of the gloom, the bottom part here is, is at the best, just maybe slightly curving. Oh, and the other thing that's in blue here, as you can see, is the spikes more nodding. Now, again, we're talking about the secondary inflorescences. That's what we're talking about here. So these spikes right here, this is the secondary inflorescence, which is a spike, or partly a raceme. Um, more nodding, branched over. Here's another one right here for uh, riverbank wild rye, versus over here in this group, the, uh, oh, excuse this group, uh, yeah, this group up here, group H, the spikes are more erect. They don't, they don't nod so much. Um, over here, the spikes are always going to be nodding and exerted from the leaf sheaths that subtend the, the uh, we can see right here, there's no leaf sheaths down here that subtend it. Um, this group over here, again, group H with four species, spikes erect, exerted or sheathed. So sometimes they are somewhat exerted, but sometimes they're, the spikes, this, again, these secondary inflorescences are not really, um, um, pro, are not protruding very far from a group of leaves that uh, sheath the, the, the base of the secondary inflorescence. And you'll see that with Virginia wild rye quite often, um, that they're not exerted. So that, that's again a second thing to look at here besides the base of the glooms. Okay, so now how do we separate silky wild rye from riverbank wild rye? Well, it's real easy, pretty much, uh, looking at this first characteristic, the ad axial surface of the leaf blades, and that means top. One way of remembering that is ad axial has a D in it, and D is also the first letter of dorsal, which means top. The other term that is, is that goes along with ad axial is ab axial uh, has a b there instead of a d ab axial means the bottom side of the blade and bottom starts with the b so it's easy to remember what those two terms mean we're talking about the top surface here the ad axial surface densely villous with fine white hairs rarely i've seen some examples where it, there's just hairs on the veins but there's still hairs there they're kind of re restricted to just the veins, but that's pretty rare. Versus over here, the ad axial surface of the blade is glabrous. And by the way, that's what this, these two pictures are showing down here. This, this um, pink line separates the two groups here, but here's a, the ad axial surface of uh, silky wild rye, and you can see hairs there. This is the top surface of riverbank wild rye, glabrous. This says glabrous or scabrous. So scabrous would not, is, is a type of pubescence, but it's not the same as, as villus. Villus hairs are very fine, soft hairs that when you, if you were to feel the hairs, it would be like, you know, feeling something very soft, very comforting sort of thing. Cotton might be, I guess, a good example. Versus scabrous is like sandpaper. So, now, if you see that there might be something on this surface that looks like it's not glabrous, feel it. If it feels like a sandpaper, then it's scabrous. All right, so that's the most easy thing to take a look at here. I have another thing here looking at the lemmas. The lemmas are also very hairy and villous, but sometimes glabrous, but every, every silky wild rye I've seen has been villous. Uh, look at the uh, spikelet, and there's a picture of the spikelets down here. You see a lot of hair, and even on this picture over here, the lemmas are uh, hairy. Um, pretty easy to see again, even with a hand lens. Versus over here, um, again, there could be some hairs, but it's it's not the soft hairs that villus means. Villus means very soft, 
fairly not real long, but but uh, fairly long hairs, relatively speaking. Hispid or scabrous would be very short, tough, short little stout, very, very tough hairs. There's a difference in the length of the lemmas, somewhat 5.5 to 9 versus 7 to 14. A little bit of overlap, but um, what you might look at is the length of the lemmas compared to the paleas, which again is that other floret bract that sits on the other side of the flower, uh, one to five millimeters longer than the paleas here for riverbank versus only 0.5 to 1.5 for silky wild rye. But there is, you know, again, the, the pubescence on the leaves is, is, should be enough to do it for you. All right, we're getting down to the last four now. Um, last four species. And um, these are going to split out again. Two species are going to split out in group J. The other two species in group K. And, and we'll deal with group K on the next slide. Uh, this is where we're going to split out um, Virginia wild rye here. It's in group J, so it comes off here on the left. And curvatus, which remember is a new species that came from a um, variety of virginicus. So these two used to be combined together under the same species, Virginia wild rye. So here's where, here's where I find myself having to collect a lot of Virginia wild rye because I know that it's, it may not all be Virginia wild rye anymore. Uh, and to really know for sure, you, you, you need a hand lens for sure to do this in the field, but I just prefer to grab, all you gotta do is grab a little bit of the in, in, inflorescence. Um, but how do we get here first? So what what we what are we saying in, in group J? Well, look at the gloomons. You can look at the other stuff here, but the gloomons is what I've highlighted for you. And that's pretty different in both of these two groups. The ons of the glooms don't even exist, meaning zero in terms of their length, or up to 10 millimeters long. At the extreme, they might be up to 15 millimeters long. In couplet uh, 9b, going to group K, um, 15 to 30 is the normal range. They might be as short as 10. So again, there could be some overlap. Uh, if you've got something that's 12 or 13, then of course that's a problem. You might have to look at some of these other things here then. Uh, but usually this works. I find this usually works. So group J, these two species have the shorter ons or non-existent ons, basically. That's group J. And then that's we're going to look at those ons again, but not the not the gloom ons. Now we're going to look at the lemma ons to separate these two. So the lemma ons, if they're five to 15, upwards of 20, uh, looking at the spikelets of, about, again, at mid spike, middle part of the inflorescence. And here, by the way, shows an example of Virginia wild rye, in which the secondary inflorescence is more exerted here. There is a leaf right there at the base though, than this one right here. This one's not exerted nearly as much as this one here. But you know, I have seen Virginia wild rye in all stages of this. I've seen Virginia wild rye where it is completely exerted as well. So you can't use that really much as a way to um, identify it. But you can use the length of the ons. Again, so the ons here are longer than over here. Uh, curvatus, which is by the way, called onless wild rye. Uh, lemma ons are so small that you can barely see them, 0 0.5, or maybe they are exactly zero. Uh, the most four millimeters. And so again, this one does not overlap with this one, even at the extreme of four right here. Uh, so again, but you have to just remember you're looking at the lemma ons, not the gloom ons. And so remember, the, these are the glooms here. Uh, here's a nice picture here showing um, everything here for Virginia wild rye here and everything here for 
all in this wild rye. And uh, I think these are all labeled, but but these are the glooms. Yeah, they're labeled right there with the yellow. Uh, these are the glooms right here. And then uh, these are the florets with you know, what we're seeing, the lemmas here. So these are lemma ons right here, how long they are. And uh, these are lemma ons over here. The amount of um, inflorescence again being exerted is kind of similar um, for curvatus as it is for virginicus here. Again, I think it can vary quite a bit. All right, again, this shows some other of the vegetative features, which again are usually not very good for identifying which species it is. And now for the last two, I guess, and we'll be done. Um, so group K now, again, um, we got to, um, uh, that's the group we're going to go to. We, we got to group K up here, just to remind us, we got to group K by looking at the gloom ons and, uh, how long they are, the longer, these, these gloom ons are longer than these ons over here. So. Those two species have longer gloom ons. Now, how do we deal with them? Go to group K. Um, these are two that aren't so commonly found, uh, McGregorii and Glabrophorus, southeastern wild rye. Again, look at table uh, one to see kind of where you find these two species. Um, McGregorii is kind of throughout the state scattered throughout the state, kind of not so much in the Los Hills or southwestern Iowa, though. It's usually found in mesic, nutrient-rich alluvial forests, uh, woodland edges. And then uh, Glabrophorus is, oh, that one is really um, probably not going to see it. Uh, there's only one record, it looks like, at least that's only one record in um, the grasses of Iowa website and uh, bone app only shows one record for a two, but it's not the same one. So Glabrophorus is another one of these very, very um, rare wild rice apparently. In fact, it probably should be listed. Uh, it's not listed right now, of course, but it probably should be. It's found in music to dry open woodland and forests similarly, but very, very unlikely to be found probably. But again, we need to know if you're out there and looking at wild rice, uh, if this is out there, we need to know about it. So, so hence the need to uh, take a look at them more closely and see how we're going to separate McGregorii from Flabrophorus. And we can do it with the oracles. Oracles are pretty decent here in separating the two. More substantial oracles here in McGregorii, two to three millimeters long, purplish black. Uh, you should be able to see them somewhat down here in this picture right here versus Glabrophorus. Oracles not even existing, zero, or if they do exist at the most two millimeters long, usually purplish brown, so the color is probably not going to help too much. Uh, there's some you know, purplish brown versus purplish black, not much difference there. But another very good one, and this is kind of built into the name, as you can see here, anthesis, which means flowering of McGregorii, is really early. Uh, it is early wild rye, mid-May to mid-June. And that, it was definitely blooming in May in the populations I've seen versus uh, mid-June to mid-July for Glabrophorus. So those don't overlap much. Uh, again, and you, you certainly have some individuals that go a little bit beyond this probably, but again, you're looking at the majority of individuals, uh, whether they're in flower or not, and based on when you're seeing them there. Again, there are some other things up here in the, in the key that you could use with the spikes and the number of nodes. Um, we can kind of see that a little bit here in these spikes here. Um, McGregorii has fewer nodes, so it's going to have fewer spikelets, basically. 9 to 16 uh, nodes. Uh, see, an average, there would be about 
you know, 12 to 13 roughly, versus in Glabra Floris, the number of nodes, the range is 18 to 30, or an average of 24, uh, which also means that there's going to be more spikelets too. And you can kind of see that in this picture, in this picture here, it looks like there's a lot more spikelets um, because there's a lot more nodes uh, present here than what we see uh, in certainly this picture and to some extent that picture too. These are two again that, um, well, I, got, I was able to find pretty good pictures, but I included these illustrations from the Grasses of Iowa website because um, finding pictures for these two species wasn't very easy. This picture of the oracles is not really worth, <laughs> not very good, um, unfortunately, because it's pretty blurred. Uh, but I threw it in because again, the oracles are an important characteristic here. That should do it. We're done, I guess, 10 minutes early. So I guess we could take some questions if there are any. I uh, don't see any in the chat, but feel free to unmute if you have questions to ask. All right. Remind people of your outing Saturday morning, Tom. Yeah, I mentioned it earlier, but I mentioned it again, right? There is an Iowa Native Plant Society. It's the first field trip of the season coming up on Saturday the 16th, meeting at 10 o'clock as usual at the Lust Hills Overlook, just to the west of Preparation Canyon State Park in the southern part of Monona County. Iowa Native Plant Society has a map and instructions and everything on how to get there, um, mainly looking for past flowers. Uh, Glenn found them blooming there on February 26th. So we know there will be blooming plast flowers. We shouldn't have to look too hard to find some, but we'll be talking about the ecology of past flowers. And of course, looking for other things. Uh, Lance said he's been seeing some leaves of astragalus maybe coming up. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some other um, prairie species coming up given the weather we've been seeing. So, and I mentioned we might also go over to um, when we're done, at 12 o'clock, um, go over, those that want to might take a quick look at Preparation Canyon State Park for some spring ephemerals over there. By the way, there's also, a, and this is on the, on the native plant list served calendar, there's also a work day, Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation is having not too far away, I think at one o'clock in the afternoon. So you could hit that if you wanted to. The uh, shooting stars, mine are coming up. They're not bloom, but they're out of the ground. Yep, you got leaves up. Yeah, and uh, I'm expecting an erythoniums to pop up any minute. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I think everything is about a month ahead. That's basically what case with those patch flowers. Um, they're a good month ahead. It's incredibly early. Well, many years ago, and I can't tell you how many years ago it was, uh, I saw them February 28th once in the, in the Prep Canyon on the south unit there. I did see them bloom one time that early. Oh, yeah. In, in February? Yeah, February 28th. Yeah. Oh, so another very early spring, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't see any questions, so thanks, everybody, for joining. All right. And thanks, Tom. Thanks for joining. See you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. Oh, and um, as you may know, next next one is uh, looking at sort of species pairs of native versus non-native uh, bad players and how to identify troublesome pairs of species or lookalike species. But And what we're trying to do is just, I'd like to just have people send me what they want me to talk about. Um, are there species pairs out there uh, or even others, other species pairs, not necessarily invasive species? It's more open to uh, participants throwing out what they want help with, basically, is the point. Send those um, requests, I guess, to Lance, hopefully by the um, middle of next week or so. All right. I, I do Sounds have one good. question, Tom. Okay. Um, yeah. You you included the the grass to tree gradient, and I was just wondering why you would, Ooh, why you included I'm that. If you could chat with that, please. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Yeah, no, yeah, five minutes yet. So, yes, I wanted to chat about this because um, 
this is something I don't know if everyone sort of looks at. And I can I could go back and put this up. You can all see it, right? I yeah. don't need to. Okay. Um, I, I don't think everyone sort of looks at the woodland forest um, synonymy the same way. You know, if you look at the way that the public and a lot of people view woodland and forest, those are two words that are synonyms. They mean exactly the same thing. So I want to alert all of you uh, to the fact that, well, that's that's out there in the public uh, arena and you know, not much we can do about it, but ecologically, uh, a lot of ecologists, I think, are coming around to the idea that we need to have those two terms to mean different things. Of course, there's a lot of similarity. And uh, what you see is just basically, there's this gradient in the Midwest and lots of places really for that matter, anywhere grassland and forested land exist you know, in the same general landscape, uh, there's a gradient from grass to trees. And that gradient, of course, is very complex. I don't, I'm not gonna try and get into all of it now, but certainly uh, important along that gradient is the frequency of fire. And the frequency of fire is also related to uh, many other factors as well, but could also be related to uh, soil types and soil fertility and availability of fuel and many other things. But the point I wanna make here is basically is, is that when you see, when you read those habitat descriptions that I have in table one, I think about woodlands and forests as being different, slightly different, as you see here. Um, and what this is showing is basically is getting a gradient as we go from some place where fire is very, very frequent, trees don't like that, and they can't survive well in a fire intense environment. So there's not many trees out there, less than 10% canopy cover. And that's why I've got those that aerial view of the same sort of landscape view, showing you sort of what canopy cover means. It's, it's the amount of area taken up by the canopies of the mature trees. Less than 10% for prairies, savanna 10 to 35%. So that means of course, trees are becoming a little bit more dense. There's also, I think there is actually a, a density version of this too. You, you could look at this in terms of density of trees. I don't have that um, at my fingertips right now. Uh, the area one is one that's easier to do because you can look up uh, if you're standing out there in wooded vegetation, you can kind of move around and look up and you can get a, a sense of what you, uh, how much sky you're seeing basically, you know, uh, and get a sense of what the canopy cover is. It, that's, it's easier to do that than it is to try to estimate the numbers of trees. And as we keep going into less fire intense environments, the trees get more dense and more canopy cover. And I now the percentages here are what I think work really well. And there's going to be differences among ecologists as to where those percentages and endpoints should be. But I really like this one because it, it, it makes a lot of intuitive sense to me in, in many ways. Um, the woodland actually straddles 50%, as you can see. 35 to 50 is 15%, and 50 to 65 is 15%. So woodland straddles the 50%, where you know it's basically 50% open and 50% closed, if you will. Uh, that's a good place for woodlands to be, I think, because this is where you're really starting to see that transition in between these two, which I would argue are really grass dominated types of systems. Of course, prairie and savanna are both dominated by this grassy herbaceous layer. Yes, savanna has a few more trees, hence that's what it makes it a savanna. And that's important because it changes the structure, it changes the habitat value, it changes some things. It's gonna change a little bit of the species composition because some of the shading is happening there. But more or less, you know, these two are gonna share a lot of the same species in the herbaceous layer. The, the transition to where you have more shade tolerant species in the herbaceous layer happens here. You can still find prairie species in, in woodland, especially in open woodland. So an open woodland is 35 to 50. That's an open woodland. A closed woodland is 50 to 65%. Then of course we get to 65% to 100%, that's a full blown forest uh, where you really have you know, shade tolerant species and, and adaptations that have to do with, with shade. And again, this, this was something that was um, put out and used in Packard um, 1997, a restoration book. 
But, uh, and again, they may have different percentages here, but I think it's important because again, we often treat these as the same and, and we shouldn't. Uh, woodlands have the potential for having had at least some fire move through the, over the surface and, and have surface fires which makes them then, you know, have a, a little bit more of a, a light component, less shrubby layer. You get a full blown shrub layer in here, but you know, more sparse shrub layer. And the thing that I'll finish on is that's important here is because when fire stops happening on the landscape, as it did 200 years ago or so, 175 years ago, then what happens is quickly these woodlands turn into forests and not quite so quickly but pretty soon afterwards savannas turn into woodlands which of course then also turn into forests um, the prairies that maintain as prairies to present day had something going for them uh, not fire but something else probably mowing hay making that kept them from becoming a savanna, which then kept that from becoming a woodland. And so when we think about what we find out in a forest, when we're walking through a forest and the species we see, we automatically, oh, those are forest species in herbaceous layer. Well, maybe not, because maybe what they would rather be in and what they are adapted to is a woodland, which is probably what we mostly had. We had a lot more woodland than we had forests. Uh, when we look at the soils that formed under forests, we're probably looking at woodlands and forests, both produce the alpha sols that are, again, characteristic soils that form under forests and have an E horizon. Um, these two would not have an E horizon that's developed very well. So these would be more of the mollusols. But again, uh, I think there's a lot of species that, you know, would prefer to be in more of a woodland, like uh, Solomon seal, for example. We can find Solomon seal in forests, but does that mean that's where it prefers to be? I think not. I think it prefers to be more in a woodland or maybe even uh, savanna to some extent. So that's just a point to, to be thinking about. We need to be managing even our forests, I think, in many cases, not as climax forests necessarily, maybe some of them. Uh, because we can't turn them all back to woodlands, but maybe we can start looking for places in our forests that are open to coming back to a woodland. So woodland restoration uh, is an important goal for us, I, I, I do believe. That's what I meant that to be. Thanks, Leo. Thank you, Jeff. And now I think we're done, right? <laughs> yep, don't see any other questions. All right. Thanks, everybody. See yep, you in two thank weeks. you. See ya.